You know, there's a, a lot of things we could talk about, uh, but where I wanted to start is where you started with this film. And what story you had in your mind that you were going to tell when you first went over there and started, you know, recording what you saw? Uh, I assume you keep an open mind anytime you enter a project about where it goes, but, but you must go in with some sense of direction, some arrow pointing you somewhere. What, what, what kind of film did you think you were going to make when you went? I, I say this with pretty much every film I, I make, and it still holds true with every film I make. When I was 21 years old, I heard Al, Al Mazel speak, and he said, if you end up with the story you started with, and you weren't listening along the way, which I think is good advice for, for life, yeah. It's good advice for filmmaking, you know, be open to the story changing, don't be dogmatic. And that's certainly something that, that was true with this film. Um, it took about two or three years to get access to actually embed with the Green Berets. Um, when we first started, it wasn't even clear that it would be about Afghanistan or that it would be about the end of the war. By the time we actually got permission, COVID, delays, it actually looked like, oh, maybe we could like look at this war. You know, this this film could be a prism to look at the end of the longest war in U.S. history. And you didn't know it was going to end when you started. No, making your inroads and then. I mean, it seemed like it might end, but it wasn't a fait accompli necessarily. And two months into filming, you know, Biden pulled out our troops, and I, I just was sort of left like. I don't think we have a film here. You know, this is probably a, uh, the first act of a film. It, it's, it's, but it's not a complete film. And so, and obviously the story wasn't over at that point. And so we reached back out to General Sadat, um, the Afghan general that we followed through the film, and, and asked him, you know, would you be open to us coming back and spending time with you? And he said, he said yes, and completely pivoted um, the lens of the story to focus on seeing this final chapter through his eyes. Can you tell us about securing that access? Because it's extraordinary what you got to see. And I wondered, just as a, as a journalist, how you established the trust that was necessary to, to have those people, the Green Berets, and then General Sadat, and all of the people working with him, I mean, they're putting their lives on the line, but they're also inviting you in to capture what I presume are, are some of the most difficult moments of their lives. Definitely. I mean, I think, in, you know, access, intimacy is the bedrock of, of what I do. Um, and that trust is not just given no. at the beginning of a film. It's something that's, that's earned. It's a sort of vow that you renew sometimes weekly, sometimes hourly, sometimes every five minutes, you know. This was a, the stakes could not have been higher here. And, you know, we owe so much to him and his men for opening up their lives to us at the, the most difficult moment in, in, in their lives. And, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly we were constantly having doors shut in our face um, and, and trying to, open those doors um, because it was, you know, it was, it was really difficult and, and it was by far the hardest film I've ever made physically, emotionally, logistically. Um, it's, it's not an easy environment to operate in. What was the process of just embedding with the Green Braves? You said it took a couple of years from your first introduction. Like, what do you have to do in order to get that placement? Um, you know, I think they, they obviously looked at my body of work. Um, I, my producing partner, Caitlin McNally, um, had worked with them previously, and so, she, you know, she had a long rapport with them. Um, but it had to go, you know, all the way up to the Pentagon. I mean, it's, it's, it, it took a very, very long time to Are gain their trust. Are they viewing you? Are they asking you, like, would it... Uh, obviously, you mentioned your body of work. You're an established person. They, can, they, they realize you're not just some person wants to, an adventurer who wants to come over and with a camera, but, but what kind of questions do they ask you or what, what do you have to do in order to present yourself as somebody who could be trusted in a war zone? Um, you know, all, all the sort of typical, uh, you know, what, what are your, what's your angle? What do you, what do you hope to get out of this? Um, what's your footprint? Um, 
you know, how, how big a crew, I mean, all, all the questions that sort of affect, would affect their lives uh, on a daily basis. Um, and in this, this, the length of this embed had never happened before in the special forces community. You know, it's a very insular community that doesn't like to show what they do. Um, and, and the Green Braves in particular are, are sort of describe themselves as like quiet professionals. They don't like to talk about what they do. They don't like to show what they do. And so it was definitely a, a very unique prism that we, that we were able to see. So once you get over there, what's the relationship like with the people you're 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 capturing that you're recording the Green Berets, like you say, they're a stoic bunch. Uh, do you find yourself engaging in their camaraderie? Do you try to be a ghost, a fly on the wall? What's your approach to to being there and and making sure that everybody trusts you? I don't love the term fly on the wall because that sort of implies a no offense to to flies, but um, a, a, you know a lack of engagement. Um, uh, sort of an impartial view. I don't. I don't know. Like, like, what I like to say is, I like to become part of the fabric of the daily lives of my subjects. Um, again, through gaining their trust, through building that trust, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it takes weeks, months, sometimes years, depending on what the film is, um, to make them comfortable. Um, and in this case, you know, we're filming with General Sadat, like from the moment he woke up in the morning to when he went to bed at night and everything in between. And so it was, um, you know, in the beginning, obviously that was, it was an onerous thing for him and, and his guys. But then I think, you know, after a couple of days, a couple of weeks, again, it just became part of the, okay, Matt sits in the left seat in the car, General Sadat sits in the right back seat, driver, you know, it's like we had our sort of arranged um, rhythm that we got. Did, did the Green Berets and General Sadat see, independently of, uh, of your personality and your footprint, your interaction with them, did they see a value in having their story told? Was, there, was that an aspect of allowing you to capture all this, that they wanted this to be captured? Of course, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the sort of, I think, if you ask any documentary subject throughout the history of documentaries, uh, it, most people question why does anyone take part in a documentary, and I think if the, if there's one common denominator, it's that you know they, people want to be understood, people want to be heard, and um, you know this is obviously a historic moment, yeah. and and I think everyone felt like it was a very important moment to capture, and, and in some sense the film is a yeah is a is a historical document of this final chapter of the longest war in U.S. history. It's so clear that empathy is one of, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a key filmmaking tool for anyone, but, uh, you know, watching this film, I, I was so overcome so many times. And I wondered if you could talk to me about empathy as a, as a, as a tool of a storyteller. Uh, I imagine you feel these things very intensely. I can't imagine standing there. Uh, that that uh, looked like a canal of, of some sort that they were standing in, that people were trying to, to uh, uh, they get airlifted out. It was full of water. I don't know what that exactly was, um, but I, I imagine it's it's hard to look at this, look in their faces, and and know that some of these people are trying to get out because they know they'll be killed uh, if and when the government falls. Um, but you you also have to control that, right? In in order to tell your story, to keep going, you can't let your emotions overcome you, right? So how do you manage that? I mean, I think, just to sort of step back up into the clouds for a second, I think that's, that's one of the things that I try to do in making these films, is taking large, amorphous subjects, the drug war in Mexico, ISIS in Syria, COVID, things that are sort of plastered across headlines, we're inundated with these things, but we never really often engage with them. And so I feel like it's my job, my responsibility to, to try to humanize them, to try to you know, put a human face to them and try to make you feel what it, would like, what it would be like to be in that helicopter or in that trench. Um, and maybe just maybe in doing so, make you care just a little bit more. And that scene that you referenced at the end of the film, 
with thousands of Afghan civilians desperately trying to flee was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my career. I filmed a lot of really sad things in my life. Um, I've certainly cried in the edit room at film festivals, you know, many times in the filmmaking process. I've never cried while shooting. And I constantly found myself both wiping my face and, 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 and like defogging the, the eyepiece of the, of the camera. It just was, it was so surreal to see these thousands of people sitting in a four foot sewage ditch, four, four foot sewer? deep uh, sewage ditch um, as 18 year old Marines were making these impossible Sophie's choice decisions on who to let in and who, who not to let in as the Taliban was sitting 100 yards away at gunpoint watching us as ISIS was circling around um, with suicide vests waiting to attack, which happened 12 hours later in that very spot that we were filming in. And all I could think about was, what have we done? Thank you for making the film. Thank you very much. Matthew Heineman, everyone, thank you for being here. Thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.